the old neighborhood. If you're driving to Parkland from downtown, your best bet is to take the Dan Ryan Expressway, I-57, which cleaves like a wide river for the bend here and a My name is Eric Charles May, the author of Bedrock Faith, the 2021 One Book, One Chicago selection by the Chicago Public Library. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Lezak, Coordinator of Special Projects with the Adult Services Department. And on behalf of everyone at the Chicago Public Library, welcome. Thank you for joining us for Community, Diversity, and Local Histories with Northeastern Illinois University. This event is part of the 2021 One Book, One Chicago season, exploring the theme, Neighborhoods, Our City's Bedrock, and the book, Bedrock Faith by Eric Charles May. Please visit OneBookOneChicago.org for more uh, upcoming programs, reading recommendations, on-demand video content, and much more coming now through the end of the year. Tonight's program is possible and One Book One Chicago is generously funded by donations to the Chicago Public Library Foundation. Visit CPLFoundation.org for more information on how you can get involved with their work. During tonight's program, we'll be monitoring the chat for questions from the audience for our Q&A, so please feel free to ask one. Now for tonight's event. First, I wanna thank our wonderful partners at Northeastern Illinois University, especially Christopher Schroeder and Tim Libretti for their partnership on One Book One Chicago, especially during the last year with all of its challenges. We at the library are so happy to continue to work with you to present wonderful programs like tonight's event. Now for our panelists. Tim Libretti is a professor of US literature and culture at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago and acting associate dean of the College of Arts and Science a longtime progressive voice, he has published many academic and journalistic articles on culture, class, race, gender, and politics, for which he has received awards from the Working Class Studies Association, the International Labor Communications Association, the National Federation of Press Women, and the Illinois Women's Press Association. Andy Meyer is the director of the F.M. Johnson Archives and Special Collections at North Park University, where he is working on archival content management and digital asset management. His mission is to use data and technology to tell stories that facilitate personal and communal transformation. Stephanie Perez is a former teaching artist in Albany Park Theater Project's school-based program at Albany Park Multicultural Academy, as well as Albany Park Theater Project's company manager coordinating ensemble and theater space logistics. She grew up in Albany Park and joined APTP as a seventh grader in 2008. She was an ensemble member through 2013 and in that time devised and performed Remember Me Like This, Feast, Homeland, and I Will Kiss These Walls. She performed with the company at Goodman Theater in both Feast and Homeland. After going through APTP's college counseling program, she went off to Kalamazoo College and studied political science. Now as a college graduate, Stephanie has returned once again to her APTP home to assist in guiding and empowering youth in our neighborhood schools. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, on behalf of Northeastern, I just want to say we're very happy to uh, be working with Young Park and Jennifer uh, Lizak at Chicago Public Libraries. 
And uh, we're going to have a discussion tonight about, about uh, Eric Charles' main novel, Bedrock Faith, and even kind of more broadly, kind of about the insights that the novel gives us into community diversity and, and local history. So we have some, some great participants here to have that, that conversation with. Um, you know, it's probably not a stretch to say that we live in an age characterized by rank and intense division <laughs> in our society. And so um, Bedrock Faith is really a timely, even urgent and illuminating novel uh, for this moment. It explores, I think it's fair to say, the, the, the cultural forces that breed both righteousness and division, um, the things that separate us from our own humanity and that of others. Um, and it, 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 it helps us see what, what gets in the way of us developing community relationships that are supportive, healing, uplifting, um, even if we pretend to hold those, uh, those values um, as our highest. Uh, but it also helps us see kind of what we need to do to, to create um, healthy community relationships uh, that are supportive um, and nurturing. Um, so with that, we'll kind of just jump into our discussion and I think we can all maybe share a few thoughts or reflections about the novel and, and see where those, those reflections take us in our conversation. And then at some point we'll open it up uh, if the questions start rolling in on the chat. I think Jennifer will let us know and we can include uh, all you voices out there that, that we the panelists can't see, but <laughs> uh, we'll get you in there. So. Uh, so Stephanie, you wanna start us off just kind of maybe sharing a few few thoughts or responses to the to the work? Sure, thank you so much. Um, so I found that it was easy to fall into this book. You know, I love the way it was organized. Um, the more and more I read, I felt like I too had lived in this community for many years and I appreciated the relationships that were so dynamic and felt so real. Um, something that stood out for me was the desire that people had to tell their truth, their own story in their own terms, um, to have the choice in the way that they were being represented to the rest of the world, to their community, to even their close ones. Um, there were a couple of moments in the book where someone unearthed or exposed a part of someone's, um, someone else's life, like when Stu Pot made photocopies of Delphina's diary or the poem that was about Mrs. Motley. Um, but even in less public ways, like when Stu reveals the photo of Mrs. Motley's late husband. Um, and at the start of the book, she was comfortable with what her story was, what her life turned out to be and what it, it is. And you know, her, her house, her marriage, her relationship with Mr. McTeer. And then one by one, someone else comes in and changes her narrative, right? Changes the way that Mrs. Motley had believed it the way she had carried it with her and acted on it. Um, and this turned her world upside down and, and obviously the community um, and uh, many uh, for others whose parts of their lives were exposed. Um, and, you know, the facts didn't change necessarily. It's just the way that they'd been reinterpreted or, or retold. And of course, this made me think of my time I spent with um, the Albany Park Theater Project. You know, we, we're telling the stories of communities who often don't have a direct say in the way that the media or politicians shape their narrative. You know, immigrant communities that are called rapists and terrorists or working class people uh, labeled as trash or, or bums, you know. Um, and, and often what I loved about the work that we did was that we interviewed people in the community and we devised a play based on their words their truths. We did little to no editing from the way they spoke their language um, to the beliefs they held to the interpretation of, of the lives that they, they lived or are living. And um, often we had storytellers come um, to see the plays that we created and they were so proud and touched at, at seeing these representations of their stories. Um, and, and that's how we knew we honored the storyteller. And this often brought other members of the community together when they could see a version of their story, their truth on the stage as art. Um, and I found it interesting, the sections of, of gossip that Charles May wrote into the novel. Um, I think about this um, as a form of 
of, of storytelling and, and, and disseminating information and interpretations of truth. Um, and in Spanish, we say chisme or chismeando. And what I found is that in my family, you know, we use these sessions of chisme to learn, right? To learn about other lifestyles, lifestyles that you may never live or encounter, um, about maybe people or lifestyles that make you uncomfortable or um, things that seem far away from you. And, and they kind of, you know, a way to navigate the world without um, exposing yourself so much, right? Um, so those, you know, this community was beautifully written and in such a real way with its rock throwing to its praying to public displays of affection. And it was, it was really a great experience to read. Um, I really liked it. Hey, thank you for those insights. We'll have a lot to uh, dig into there in the way you th think about the novel and storytelling. So I'm excited to do that. Andy, did you have some uh, initial, sure. initial responses to um, sure, I can share a little of my response too, but I just want to say, Stephanie, our notes are very similar. I, I, some of the same things you highlighted are, are some of the issues I highlighted. And it's interesting to kind of, you're coming at it from a theater perspective, I'm coming at it from an archival perspective. So I'm kind of interested in how, how our different approaches are, are picking up some of these same themes. Um, so uh, maybe by way of personal introduction, um, my name is Andy Meyer. I, I work at North Park University in Chicago, and I'm an archivist there. So I oversee three main collections. The North Park University archives, the archives of the Evangelical Covenant Church, and the Swedish American archives of, of Greater Chicago. So all that is to say, my 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 work with communities with records is 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 archival, and um, and historical in some ways. Um, I should also confess now that I'm not much of a fiction reader. I <laughs> do mostly nonfiction. So this was a this was a retreat and kind of outside my comfort zone to be reading this book. But I, I loved it for some of the same reasons Stephanie mentioned. Um, this this really vivid sense of community, which I think comes through in like the, the descriptions of the place and the neighborhood and the buildings, the descriptions of the people. It, it's a pretty large cast of characters and they all felt very, um, no one felt one dimensional. They all had something interesting or some, some maybe um, something they're presenting and something that's that's hidden or some nuance or something that made them all very interesting. Um, yeah, the, the, some of the things I focus on were, were just like Stephanie, these, there are several points in the story where there, these are objects or these records, as I would call them, this journal entry, this poem, a photograph, um, come into the story and have a really transformative effect on, on the lives of the people there. And I think that's kind of in, in some conversation with this kind of gossipy story, like one chapter I know just gives off like 13 variations of what neighborhood people are talking about this story. So there's kind of like this element of, of the archival or like the, 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 the object, the photograph, the journal or the newsletter even as being this 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 um, tangible physical thing, and then there's these stories that kind of come around it, and I think that interplay between between for, from my my perspective, archival record, you know, something that we would have in our archive, a journal, a photograph, a letter, um, and kind of the stories people tell around them, and and many times the 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 photograph or the poem or the letter the letters or newsletters. They require some community interpretation to make sense of them. Where if you just picked it up from the street, and read it, or in my context, you know, pulled it from a box and, and, um, and looked at it, you might not have the whole history, or you might not have the whole story to know. Oh, this signifies something, or like the way he's looking tells this tremendous story that you wouldn't know, or or this this kind of coded verse is a, is a crucial detail that, that you need to that you need to unpack. Um, so I thought that was from an archival perspective, I thought those, that, that the relationship between archival or maybe not even archival, I don't wanna put my own words in it. The, the relationship between objects or records and, and stories and, and was, was a very interesting dynamic that I really like to kind of think about from my perspective. Um, so I, I, I really enjoyed it um, and, and appreciate your comments, Stephanie, you're, you're hitting on some of these same themes, but from a very different perspective. So that's yeah, fascinating. Absolutely. 
Excellent. So, so uh, it is interesting, uh, Andy, how you talk about archives and Stephanie brought this up too. the archives are really these hidden stories that kind of get unearthed about each character um, that um, arguably, maybe you disagree, kind of begin to create disruption and conflict um, in the novel. And it may be that, uh, I mean, I, I would suggest that we tend to see a community kind of breaking down. Um, <laughs> that is, um, characters get, when, when things are exposed about them, feel shamed and leave. And, and so we can, maybe, maybe that will raise some questions we can talk about, about um, what creates healthy community, um, <laughs> right? What do we need to sustain um, community? But just, you know, so the main driver of the plot, just to briefly rehearse this, is the character Stewpot, who was, um, oh, for lack of a better term, kind of a young ne'er-do-well who had burned down some garages, killed people's cats, <laughs> uh, introduced drugs, kind of helped ruin some families, um, uh, returns to the community after serving some time in prison. And the novel really then kind of charts how the community deals with that return. And they are not happy about the return. He's never really welcomed, right? They never really give him a chance. They're more interested in how they can get rid of him. Um, spoiler alert, we find out at the end of the novel that he likely has some kind of serious mental illness um, so that maybe some kind of healing or compassion or treatment would have been in order, which he never gets. And that's in, in some sense, um, kind of juxtaposed with the brief story about Reggie Butler, who is the youth who ends up accidentally burning down Mrs. Motley's house when, when he tries to burn down Stu Pot's house. And she does not. She says, I'm not going to tell on you because I don't think you should go to prison and ruin your life. So we almost have a counterpoint in this brief moment with, with Stu Pot, which might show us two ways of responding um, to, uh, to kinds of violence, right? Or, or negative behavior to kind of sustain community. But I, I, I'm wondering, um, you know, give, given the sort of the archival perspective you're taking and the, and the way, Stephanie, you're thinking about storytelling, um, how, how you see these archival stories, if you want to put them that way, the personal records that sort of come to, come to the surface in the novel about certain characters, right? Um, what you think about the community response to them, um, that they seem disruptive, but um, what can we learn about community or the stories we, what narratives should do to create healthy community? I don't know if this is making sense, but if you have some insight into these conflicts that create, come about because these stories come to the surface. Yeah. I. I don't know if I know what it means to talk to what what how that could indicate a healthy community or or something like that. I do think it illustrates, at least to me, several of these um, records that come up, like um, the journal or the diary entry, for example, that is kind of stolen and copied and shared. You know, that's a good example of like the in, in creating that record, there was intention and meaning there. And then when it's shared broadly, that has a very different meaning. Um, and and other and other likewise for the photograph of Miss um, Motley's husband. You know, I don't know the circumstances that was created, but that's another situation where an object could have multiple meanings to multiple people. So I think it, if anything, it just shows this complicated or the poem, which was. Um, you know, an exp a personal expression that was meaningful enough to be saved for a long time. And then again, so it has meaning and creation and different meaning later on when it's, when it's interpreted by different people in different contexts. So I think all that to me reveals is the kind of the complicated nature of records and how they have multiple meanings over time. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what it tells me about healthy communities or, or or communities in, in decline or despair. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an interesting question though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, from what I can interpret, the, these archives were, they were they were unearthed, but with a very specific interpretation. And that was Stu Pot, you know, saying you are all sinners for this and this and this, right? 
the way that sometimes history can be told through a one perspective. Um, and I think um, the community, instead of coming together and having conversation and dialogue um, about what has been unearthed, I think they continue to be secretive and um, cutting people out and, and, and feeling ashamed and, and running away, right? Um, instead of deciding to, to be honest with each other, to um, educate each other, um, it's it's harder when when things when these archives are of such personal, right per personal histories as opposed to like a larger event in the community, um, but in a way it becomes everybody like the community's history, right? Um, because of of the events that that it led to. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Stephanie. That they the community doesn't talk about these things, and Stupot represents a kind of judgment, right? He he takes the behaviors and he says you're sinners. You're sinful, um, and yet the community really does not um, have a different sense of judgment than Stupot's, right? So when Irma Smedley, for example, when 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 Stupot exposes her as a lesbian, she says, "Well, no big deal." But the community says she's a lesbian. This is not good. Why would she want to do that? She's attractive. This is disgusting, right? So so they engage in the same kind of judgment that Stupot does, and so. Stupot, while he, while he might seem, you know, he's represented as kind of different, actually is, holds up a mirror <laughs> yeah. to the community. And I think it's interesting kind of what you're both saying, because what the archive, the history that we learn is really the truth about these characters. So the community in some sense has not known, right, the truth about these characters and the characters have been hiding the truth themselves. Um, yeah. And there's a, there's a line that stood out when Irma Smedley is, talks about other gay characters in the neighborhood. And she says, but they never talked about themselves. And she writes, as long as a person never actually said they were what they were, most people in the neighborhood were willing to carry on as if nothing was out of the ordinary. And I thought that kind of, um, in light of what you're both saying, presented a kind of interesting way to think about community. Like what kind of community or neighborhood is it? Is it a neighborhood with a strong sense of community if you have to hide who you are or you can't say who you are, um, where you have to repress elements of yourself or hide parts of yourself? I don't know. So, so kind of along with what you're both saying, when these things come to the surface, um, and, and Andy, you said, well, I don't know what I was talking about when I was talking about what creates a healthy community, but I kind of asking like, Stephanie, you're just seeing a healthy community, a healthier way to deal with that might've been to talk about it, right? In many ways, all of these, many of these characters have either engaged in some kind of marital fidelity or have some secret that's viewed as sinful. And maybe that just says, well, this is human behavior and, and <laughs> right? This is how yeah. we love. This is how we get along. And maybe we should be less judgmental of it and more understanding. And if it's not a healthy behavior, maybe we need more healing about it rather than sending people away. I, I, I don't know. So those, are, those yeah. are some thoughts that I had. Actually, something, something you said made me think of this. And again, I'm not a fiction reader, so I don't have like the mind to understand metaphor or, um, <laughs> or Im imagery, really. But one thing that you're, I was thinking about was, um, I think at the beginning of the, the very beginning of the book, they describe Miss Motley's house as kind of full of pictures and seems like it's covered in kind of family images. And then that house eventually burns down. And then at the end, she's left with a single photo of her, of her family, of her, of her husband that is, is devastating. So I think that maybe that goes to like this point of like, she's maybe constructed a certain narrative about herself that, that, you know, has, is framed and, and it's maybe true in a sense, but, but it's, it's selective and it's there to provide comfort or, or, or that's the, that's the narrative she's constructed for herself. But then that, that, that's, that's burned, that's lost. And then she's left with this one image that, that really changes her understanding of her, of herself, her marriage. So I think that's the very, um, very interesting. Another piece that I think maybe is related to this is the, the neighborhood seems sort of prideful in itself, which I think would be a good thing to think about, you know, taking care of it. And, but there's always a sense of like, oh, people like Stupot don't live in the neighborhood. But it's like, yes, he does. He's your neighbor. Like, <laughs> he does live there. 
And like everyone else has their own things too. So I think there's an element to which this kind of pride of community has a shadow side of, of denying the, the, the raw or the, the, um, the unresolved or the parts that people don't want shared. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. The parts that people don't want shared. Um, I don't any any thoughts, Stephanie? Um, I know that you work with with community storytelling. I've done projects with community storytelling, and I'm just wonder as you do these projects, you th see things unearthed or come to see communities telling their different elements of the community telling the story very differently. Um. I, yeah, I definitely see. Um you know, different interpretations of, of the community itself um, come to come out in, in the storytelling um, and, and different, um, you know, Albany Park is, and that's where we did most of our ethnography, is a very diverse neighborhood in that you've got um, immigrants from all over the world living side by side. Um, you know, like I had my neighbors in the upstairs apartment were Brazilian and to my left we had um, Peruvian uh, family and to my right we had um, in, in, a lot of Indian families and you know it's it's really interesting because in in the book the parkland they're mostly um, black families right um, so it the community shows up different than in a community who doesn't speak the same language doesn't have the, a similar religion the same religion right um and yet they still find ways to be community um and still find ways to you know get on the same bus and the same train go to the same you know citizenship classes in the at the uh -huh. community center um and 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 create community um and even though they have these cultural or language barriers there's which could easily cause different interpretations i think um there are things that bonded them that caused them to stick together. Um, and um, it reminds me, there's a moment in the book where, I, I don't know if it's the police that's asking questions or the, or the news reporters, but the Parkland community decides to kind of, you know, be quiet and, and not give away too much. And um, it's like the one time they kind of have a, a moment of solidarity. Yeah. Um, and they kind of keep, decide to keep their the drama in house. Um, and um, yeah, I think there are definitely, um, in the work that I've done, encountered groups, you know, solidarity in groups um, that have, you know, huge differences amongst each other, but um, kind of because they have this shared space um, and, um, they just, you know, they find a way. I don't know. Yeah. That makes sense. Then when you talk about how there's something that that bonds them despite all these differences, because this is arguably on one level a more homogenous community. Although I would say there are yeah. well, okay, I see you're shaking your head because I don't even agree with what I just said necessarily. But right, because one of the issues in the novel is probably religious sectarianism that characters go to different churches. Mm -hmm. And we even see how the two characters, uh, Mrs. Motley and Mr. McTeer, seem to have an affection, maybe even a love for one another. Um, there's always some suggestion, well, maybe they'll get married. Um, mm -hmm. But what divides them are their, they go to different churches. And that actually seems to, to be the barrier for them in terms of getting together, like, so that their faiths divide them rather than bring them together in, in certain ways, um, perhaps that's one way of looking at it, um, which interests me because it got to me to think like, what's the, what's the meaning of this title, Bedrock Faith? Hmm. Religion seems to be a um, strong, um, you know, a strong uh, element of each character's constitution in certain ways, certainly stewpot. <laughs> um, and, and yet, um, it doesn't seem to, to, to bring them together, which is arguably kind of what religions rooted in, in love and kindness and so forth are, are, are supposed to do. Um, we tend to see the divisions in this community 
Um, but we also see a lot of support and, and nurturing as well. We see, I think, both sides, which kind of, I don't know, gets to this, makes me think of what you're talking about, Stephanie. Like, what is it that holds these com a community together? And you were even talking about Albany Park, where there's people with really powerful differences, <laughs> right, who still manage to kind of hold it together. Um, yeah. Uh, at least one way in which I felt like I loved the description and I felt like it was so true to my own uh, experiences, both religious and cultural, is like at sometimes, several times in the book, um, someone's sick or they're in the hospital or return from the hospital and all the neighbors seem to instinctively know to like make food for that person and bring them food. And I, I think I don't want to, I don't know enough about cultures to say that's a universal expression of care, but it seems like many cultures can express you know, kind of care for each other via food. And I love that it was just kind of narrated as kind of like a, of course, people started making food for the family that, you know, is coming back from the hospital and they're, they pack their fridge full of food. So I think that's like one, one aspect of where I felt like the neighbors were genuinely extending care for each other to kind of know they need, they need help with food or with cleaning the, cleaning the house after someone's fallen ill. And I think another way in which the community is united is is through some of these shared rituals, like the um, the harvest fair, the football games, kind of some of these um, maybe not religious ceremonies, but quasi cultural. You know, these are like we've always done this this way. We set up chairs this way. We go sit here and watch this. So I think some of those rituals are, are have this uniting force on the community. Interesting. So some of those rituals are also the the opportunities for mischief. Which I thought was interesting. That these, <laughs> these where the community is gathered somewhere, that's when some of these. Um, history, yeah, that's you know, true. This, the, that's the true. Negative things happen in the book in those same. Yeah, time. I don't know what I don't know. Again, I don't know the imagery of that. I don't know what to make of that. Yeah, but I thought it was interesting. That is interesting. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll discuss some more. But I did want to just ask Jennifer maybe if anyone is in the audience or invite the audience to to uh, ask some questions or raise some issues. Uh, for a discussion. Um, if not, we'll we'll keep talking, but. Great. Yes, we have a couple of questions that's come in and if people have additional questions, please leave them in the chat. Uh, so first one is emailed in to us. Uh, when I read this book, it almost seemed to me like the collective neighborhood was itself a character in the book. Do you agree? That is a great question. That is a really interesting insight. So any thoughts on the collective character of the neighborhood itself? You both have strong sense. Uh, Andy as an archivist of the neighborhoods and Stephanie, uh, you're very aware of like the community almost as a storyteller. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on that? I, mean, I would say definitely throw the book that the neighborhood has a guiding influence. So I, I like to do this, but I can't because what would the neighbors think or so I think it does exert some powerful influence on, on the actions and behaviors of the, of the characters. And even a sense of morality, like what would the neighbors think if I left the house so late at night or if, you know, and you see it come through. I mean, if people are not making this up, like, you know, oh, she went right to Mr. McGear's house after, you know, this disaster, oh my. So like, there is like a real element in which it is um, the neighborhood as a character does exert influence. At least my mind. Yeah, no, I think I think that's good. I think that's accurate, Stephanie. Yeah, I think I mean just the fact that the neighborhood acted as one against Stu Pot. Um, I th I mean that's that's in a way um, like the neighborhood's character. Um, and there were moments uh, when I think that um, Charles May wrote about the community. Um, in contrast to other communities in Chicago, um, and and earlier uh, you were saying that um, you know kind of they have a pride to them um, and a certain history that they want that their community to um, be seen as. So I think um, you know a lot of a lot of the characters were saying that they even though they were felt so exposed and, and their truth so unearthed, they still, they couldn't leave the community, right? Even when there was a move, it, it, was, it had to be within the community. Um, so I think it definitely, that's a powerful force. Yeah. 
And, and yeah, I like the point you're making, Andy. I think you said this, but um, if not, I'll say it anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is an, uh, a really powerful community ethos or morality, and that's precisely kind of what, what leads them to hide things, right? Um, and not be open about things is that that community has like an overwhelming sense of right and wrong that guides their behavior. And it's a larger than any of the characters, individual belief systems or anything, right? They, they view it as a force larger than them. I think that they don't wanna be seen as uh, dissenting from it or differing, diverting from it in, in, any, in any kind of way. Um, and as you, I think have both pointed out, right? Um, May makes a point of, of beginning. Well, you saw him reading, he, he opens talking about the Dan Ryan Expressway. <laughs> right? And kind of how these neighborhoods got formed, and and that you know the Dan Ryan, um, as I'm sure you know, but uh, was um, right. The building of the Dan Ryan was designed segregation of of the city. So even that begins to define the character of these these um, neighborhoods, and even even that it's right um, a all or mostly sort of black uh, community, right means it kind of, it, it, it has a history larger than any of the, of the individual uh, members kind of that, that placed them there. So also just the history of all the churches and religious religions and the religious splits. And when this church split and that church split, right, which um, creates divisions within the community larger than any of the, the members. That's a, that's a really great, really great question. So thanks to whoever submitted that. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't like I understand the imagery of this, but it also strikes me as like the people that have that leave the community, which I think would be Stu Pot, Irma, and uh, the Davenports. That's all. They're all viewed very negatively. Like leaving is or being exiled is is, is bad. Um, and maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe there's some sort of other angle to that. But it just strikes me as that's that's a negative connotation to leave. Great. Um, we have another question from Richard who asked, my initial feeling is that Stu Pat uses his original apology to the neighbors to see what everyone is up to and whether or not they are sinners, your thoughts. So is Stu Pat just being nosy when he went around with his first apology? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I also strikes me that Stu Pat's, I think the one character where we don't get an insight into his, mm. his mind. Everyone else, we kind of get a sense of what's going on there. And we only get this insight at the very end of the book, which again, hints at some serious mental illness, you know, maybe affecting the entire time we know Stupat as a character. Um, so that, that strikes me as, as, as some, he's somehow a mysterious character for more than one way that we both don't have access to his thoughts like we do all the other characters. But I guess I never thought of it, his motivation in the apology as, as being an affront, uh, being um, antagonistic to the neighbors. I thought it was merely misguided or, or misinformed. Yeah, I, re I really believed. Um, I was like with like Mrs. Motley, like I believed um, his that he was he wanted to change his life, and and he probably was being truthful in that moment because if if we do consider. Uh, his mental illness, you know, he he probably was f genuine in the, in those moments that he wanted to apologize and um, change his ways. Um, so I definitely believe that at the beginning of the story, um, and I and still actually I think he knew more about his neighbors than um, maybe they thought they did because he he took that picture of miss um, motley's late husband and that was you know that had to be before when he was a teenager taking pictures and i think even though he was viewed as a as an you know a reckless teenager um, causing trouble he was very integrated in the community he he you know he was um he knew about everybody's business and and in a way he got to know more about the community than other people did through his mischief yeah, and, and, and Reggie's story, Reggie's relationship with Miss Motley does strike me as somehow parallel to Stupots. And I kind of, um, probably like other people, I'm, I've been watching the TV show Ted Lasso on, 
on TV now. Um, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a film person either, so I don't really have experience talking about this. But one of the themes I, I get from that show is similar to this book, which is that everyone has this kind of nuanced, complicated dark side or some some public persona and some dark side they're dealing with and that kindness can be kind of transformative in in, in those moments mm-hmm. um so i think about that for for how miss motley related to reggie um which was kindness and understanding in her own way and i wonder if this whole uh, one of the interpretations one of the questions i'm lingering with is like is this book kind of an indictment on the community for for not for not extending care to stupot in, in his youthful transgressions, if he was always just written off as a bad kid or something, how that could be reinforced through through escalating violence and then finally, you know, encounters with law enforcement that are negative and the you know, you know, in the prison system, which is negative, that then has this corrupting influence on him. So I wonder if that's one of the lessons I'm taking from this book. Is it is this an indictment of the community for how they did not extend grace and care to Stuba? Yeah, that's an interesting point, Andy. And, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Motley does say at the end, right, she comes to this, I won't say conclusion, but a wondering, like, was the community, did the community abdicate its responsibility to Stew Pot early on, right? Because she, right, remember, she doesn't want to send Reggie to prison. Right. Um, and so that that's a really kind of interesting point. And I would say, like, Mrs. Motley... I know the question is about Stu Pot, so I'll get there, but we haven't talked too much about Mrs. Motley. And Mrs. Motley, in certain ways, is like the, um, she's probably the character who we kind of see think the most, if that makes sense, or try to process what's happening in the community most and kind of really tries to practice her faith. Um, and she's by no means a, a perfect character, but she seems to process the most, be a kind of critical consciousness um, for the community. And at the end, she's the one, right? She found, finds out that, as, as you've all alluded to, that her husband um, was closeted man or bisexual or gay or whatever, but he had been had relationships with men during their marriage. And unlike what we see elsewhere in the novel, she does not make any judgment. Mm-hmm. Um, at least she comes to the point where she says, I don't view him as a degenerate. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't I don't quite understand him. Right. <laughs> she goes, I wonder if it would be different if I had seen him in pictures with a woman. Would that be different? She goes, this is hard for me to understand. It's a mystery to me. Right. But she goes, but but I think as as one of you suggested earlier, right, people are kind of mysterious. They have these nuances and complications. And the novel is kind of asking us, like, I think as a community to recognize people's complications. Yeah. Right that people are always going to transgress and violate um, <laughs> violate laws or rules or vandalize or whatever, right? But what do you do as a community? Do you expel the person? Or as Stephanie was saying, do you try to find some way of working through those issues in a, in a healthy way? You know, even if there are punishment and consequences, like how do we, how does a community resolve this and, and keep people together in a healthy way? So... I heard a little noise. Is that something? Did you want to say something, Stephanie? You popped up on my screen. <laughs> um, um, we have a few more questions. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, bring them on. So Elizabeth says, this interesting discussion of the intertwining threads of community, local history, gossip, and one's ability to be redeemed reminds me of Toni Morrison's novel, Sula. Does America as an idealized concept or source of identity play into this novel? Does America matter? Or is neighborhood the more salient location? That's a great question. You know, I, I just say quickly, I very much thought of this in, in relationship to Sula. So I appreciate the insight. And, you know, the question that Sula ends on, and I'm just going to say this really quickly so my fellow, uh, my peers can speak. But, um, you know, Sula ends with this question. It says, well, you know, the bottom, which is the neighborhood in Sula, was a place, but it really wasn't quite a neighborhood or a community. It had all this similar dysfunction. And I think Morrison's asking these similar questions um, about kind of like, what does it mean to, to love, right? How do you create a, a loving kind of community and accepting people's flaws and drawbacks and 
shortcomings, but also just being able to accept human behavior. <laughs> um, this novel has, you know, characters have a hard time accept, accepting how people love and, um, you know, all these things that are kind of natural human responses to the world, perhaps, but um, they can't accept. But I think that's a great analogy, but I'll let my, my peers respond as well about the relationship between a neighborhood and the country. I mean, I've not, I have not read Sula, so I'm not sure about that. But I think, you know, this neighborhood really acts together and as one, I, I don't think I've ever seen like s such intertwinings of actions and decisions and, um, you know, all, the, all that, the events that they create that make happen, right? Um, and they, you know, they, I feel like they do try to distinguish themselves from other communities. Um, and, but I, I feel like we should, I think, always read um, neighborhoods and people within the context of the rest of the country, right? Um, because it, 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 you know, those forces do really shape the people um, in in the neighborhoods, right? Um, and and what their uh, identities might might bring to to all these events that um, kind of snowballed. Thank you. And, you know, uh, I don't know if Andy wants to respond, but we should, you know, again, while while May really focuses on the internal dynamics of the African-American community, we shouldn't forget it exists because of segregation. And so um, to the point, and it's an interesting question about how he represents America and whether it's about neighborhoods or the country. I mean, the country is the, the character of the country is one conditioned by segregation, um, which splinters us into communities that try to be as self-determining as possible, right? Which this is a, an act of like American resilience or African-American resilience to be self-determining uh, <laughs> within a segregated world. I don't know, it's a really complicated question. Um, we have time for, I think, two more questions. So we'll just do this one. Uh, Christopher asks, I was intrigued by the way that alliances were formed and shifted throughout Parkland, but couldn't quite perceive a pattern in these. Do you have any thoughts on these emerging and shifting alliances in the story? Any thoughts? No, I, I have no theory to that or <laughs> overarching sense of what, what they mean. Um, if anything, yeah, I just, yeah, I don't know. I guess the shifting nature of them makes me think it's to hint at this kind of divisive nature, maybe of, of religion, of, of how to treat people, how to extend, well, how much grace is too much grace? How, how aggressive do you need to be in, in countering the attacks and responding to these things? So I didn't see any theory or overarching you know, um, trajectory there, but just as a way to kind of see that the, that the community is, di is divided at different points and how to respond. I think mostly how to respond to Stupot and the, and the things that he causes in the neighborhood would be how I see it. That's great. And I think we'll, oh, sorry, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think that's a good response. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I think we'll end on this question because it's so great. Um, can you share about your experiences working with or for your neighborhood and your projects and um, how you work with the neighborhood, how it works, how it doesn't work? So I know each of you have different um, things to share uh, from, from your own work. So I'll give you some time to talk a little bit about that and share with our audience. Stephanie, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so I uh, grew up in Albany Park. I, I was born in Mexico, um, but I grew up in Albany Park. Um, and I was I joined the Cedar Company when I was a teenager. And what we did was we went out into the community and we interviewed people, um, usually around a theme that just kind of emerged or 
um, or maybe that was um, like vital in the news at, at that time. Um, so uh, one of the shows that we did actually, the way that we collect the stories was we, um, we, they gave us, uh, they gave, you know, a group of teenagers, they gave us all some money and they sent us out to different uh, restaurants in the neighborhood. And if you know Albany Park, there's like all kinds of restaurants, you know, um, Mexican restaurants and uh, Syrian restaurants and Korean restaurants. And we would go and we and interview the people that worked there. Um, and just kind of starting from there, we slowly started to collect stories surrounding food. Um, and we um, we had we collected all sorts of stories from stories about the link card and and having food and not having food and, and what that meant in your family um, and uh, stories of you know, befriending a cow and then having to butcher it um, to, you know, to feed your family. Um, and, uh, and just kind of getting to know my community this way, um, it was like, it was, you know, the people you pass every day, right? Like the tamale lady um, and uh, the, peop the people you buy meat from the butcher, um, you, start, you start to feel like you're a part of their, their story, right? All of a sudden, things that happen in the community, they're, they're different to you. Um, and I think, and then turning it into art, I mean, that was its own um, wonderful, <laughs> beautiful experience. Um, yeah, I could talk all day about it. I wish you would. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, I, I can talk a little bit about my work because again, it's, it's it's very similar in some ways, but very different in other aspects. So um, again, the, my three prime collections relate to North Park University, the Evangelical Covenant Church and Swedish American immigrants to Chicago. So I don't collect neighborhood history per se. That's not one of the communities I serve. Actually, this do all of the Chicago Public Library do that at the Salzer branch of the um, for the North Side neighborhood collections. Um, but we do collect stories from the communities I serve. And, and I, I'm also kind of aware that I think in this book, perhaps there's a warning for me and, you know, it's expressed via literature, but it's something I've thought about a lot, which is like, I'm, I'm kind of the, um, if, if one of the powers Stupot has over the community is releasing records and, and using these records to create chaos or tell stories or challenge stories, I think that's the same kind of power that institutional archives can have in that there's power to do good or power to do bad or power to um, fight oppressive structures or power to support them. So I think that's something that many archives and other memory institutions like libraries, museums are coming to terms with now. Um, and, and certainly, certainly we are corporately and I am personally for this. Um, but we collect, we collect records that, that like the ones mentioned here, uh, and it's interesting to kind of see what those are like to get an insight into, into people and places and events and, and neighborhoods. So I'll take a moment here to plug uh, an exhibit that's up at the Albany Park branch of the Chicago Public Library right now, which is um, based on work that a student at Northside College Prep did um, over the summer internship. And she, was, she wrote um, a history of the North River Commission, which is a nonprofit organization, community organization, kind of focused on Albany Park, North Park um, areas, the, the intersection of the Chicago River and the North Shore Channel, um, which was started in 1962. And it tells, and it kind of chronicles some of the early work they did, um, two of which I think are relevant to this story. One is the profound influence the North River Commission had on the physical neighborhood of, of Albany Park and North Park in, in researching this history um, they were very, the North River, North River Commission was opposed to a plan to build an expressway along the North Shore Channel, which is now green space and park area. So it's almost unthinkable to think of that as an expressway running north south here. Uh, and then another thing that I think was very relevant and took on new meaning in this book is they had a youth development program where basically they, um, if a youth had some interaction with law enforcement rather than going through the police system, they would be referred to the North River Commission. The North River Commission would have a, a committee meeting that would involve the person, their family, a social worker, a psychologist, potentially clergy, um, that would seek to intervene and, and work to find some way to restore the, the person to the community. So I think of that as like an interesting model of community um, justice that, that I think if, if had been available in the Parkland community could have, could have altered the story yeah. in really profound ways. So, so um, those are some of my reflections as, as, as 
archivist, I guess, uh, with, yeah. related to these communities. That's awesome. That's a great, that's a great way to think about this novel in a great kind of historical perspective. Yeah, I'll just quickly say, you know, um, shout out to my wife, Terry, who I know is watching. So, hey, but she's a community activist and she always gets me out in the community. And, you know, I live on the Northwest side. And, you know, I think the lesson is that that kind of that resonates with me in this novel is, you know, community is difficult, right? It's a, uh, it's, um, it's, it's activist work. It's, it's, it's something to be, to be nurtured and, and worked at. And I know, um, back after Charlottesville, uh, Terry organized, a, you know, she's like, we got to do something. <laughs> we got to do something. So she just put on Facebook, we're having a rally over at Portage Park, which is our park, our neighborhood. And uh, we didn't, she didn't know, we didn't know if anyone would show up and like 300 people showed up. And like we sang, we walked the park with candles. Um, and that led to just a kind of a lot of work in the community and an organization she kind of helped found um, that people really wanted to take part in. It's like people don't want to leave, right? People say, this is our community and we're going to try to make it what we want. Um, even though there are contending forces and, and difficulties, you know. So I think in that sense, um, you know, Mrs. Molly is a power, powerful example in the novel of like, she doesn't want to leave, but she's going to try to figure out how to help and get along with people as difficult as it is. Um, so I think the novel is pretty powerful in that way, it resonates with kind of what happens in our neighborhoods and communities. And the good lesson that I think Air, Andy said this earlier on, like, or maybe it's when we were talking off camera, um, this isn't, you know, easy harmony, right? <laughs> It's not what it means to get along with people in the world and cooperate and figure things out. You know, it's some work. And it's worth it. That's great. Well, I think that's all the time we have for tonight, but I want to thank you all for being here. Thanks to Tim Labretti, Andy Meyer, and Stephanie Perez for being here with us tonight on this wonderful panel for this great discussion. Special thanks also to Christopher Schroeder and Young Park for their work in making tonight's event possible. I want to thank CPL Tech Leland Mosley for producing tonight's event, and thanks to all of you for being here. Please visit onebookonechicago.org for information on other upcoming events around our theme, Neighborhoods, Our City's Bedrock, including book discussions, films, author events, art programs, and more. Also visit the CPL YouTube and Facebook pages for on-demand video content, including from tonight's program. Have a great week, everyone.